We are in a series that we have called Freedom, The Life You Always Wanted. And the topic I'm going to be speaking on today is the purpose of freedom. Now, I was thinking on this last night, just for a little bit. Um, I was reflecting back to a time when I was about 10 years old. I went to Italy with my family, which at that point consisted of my mum and my dad and my sister Caroline. She's about six years older than me. And uh, we went to this campsite in Italy. And I remember making friends with a person who wasn't a great influence. He was an English guy. He wasn't Italian. Okay, he was English. But he wasn't a good influence on me, right? Because there was this little campsite shop there. And he said, that campsite shopkeeper is so, like, old, you can take whatever you want in the shop. And he doesn't notice. Okay, now, I know for some of you who put me on a pedestal, you're thinking, Dom, Pastor Dom would never do something so heinous as stealing something from the shop. Well, let me just break it to you. I did. I did steal something. Yeah, I know. It's bad, isn't it? It was like this rhubarb and custard um, uh, kind of lollipop stick thing. And I realized that I picked it up. And the first one, I felt like, oh, this is terrifying. But like the adrenaline rush is insane. And I just put it in my pocket. And I ran out of the shop. And I went and enjoyed it behind the bike shed, right? And there was this kind of moment where I thought, I'm never going to do that again. But then the next day came. And I thought, that was just too easy. And so the next day I went. And I thought, I probably can take two or three now. And so I took two or three, and I remember running out. And anyways, it compounds, and it gets worse and worse, to the point where I am loading up my shirt. Um, I mean, judge if you want. I've repented. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus, okay? Um, but I run out, and, I, and I'm coming with my shirt. And literally, I remember as I'm running, there are things falling out of my, the shirt that I have tucked over stuff. Now, any children listening to this message... Stealing is always wrong, okay? It's even wrong, if, even if the Lord's going to use it as a preaching illustration in 20, 30 years, okay? It's still wrong. And uh, I remember getting back to the caravan and going to my room. My mom and dad had gone on a walk. And I remember my sister saw me drop all of this stuff that I'd taken onto the bed. And she said, where'd you get that from, Dom? And I was like, I bought it. And she says, where'd you get your money from, Dom? And because I'm an awful liar, I said... I stole it. I took all of this. It wasn't mine, but I just took it from the shop. And I kid you not, my sister, the grin on her face, because she knew now that she had leverage over her younger brother. And boy, did she use that leverage for many weeks, even on the way back. We both had the, and uh, Nan bought us some cassette players. And, um, and, uh, one of those old school cassette players that didn't have a rewind button. It just had one fast forward button. You'd have to turn the cassette to rewind and fast forward it to go backwards. Weird. For those of you who don't know, you don't know, okay? But it was like the original MP3. But now I'm thinking there's even stuff beyond MP3. So I don't know what it was. It was just like this Walkman thing. And I remember all the way back from Italy, every time she wanted to find a specific song, she would use my cassette machine to burn my batteries to get to the point that she wanted to get to because she says, I'll just tell dad if you don't let me do it. And literally, this carried on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I was just like this nervous wreck at the time. We had lots of different people living in our house at home. Uh, but me and my sister shared a bedroom. And I just remember all the time, she would say, Oh, Dom, can you go and get me a drink? And I'm like, No, please, I don't want to. And she says, I'll tell Dad. All the time. All the time. She was like the accuser of the brethren. She, that's what she was to me. She was constantly just hanging this over me over and over and over. And I don't want to overplay it, but literally it really wore my soul down because I felt so guilty. And it wasn't just that I felt bad about stealing. I was worried about what my mom and dad might do once they find out because I thought it's only a matter of time because I can't be my sister's slave for the rest of my life. It just seemed overwhelming. And I remember there was one night in particular where she asked me to do something and I was like... Oh, Okay, this is the last thing I'm ever going to do. And I didn't go to sleep. I was tossing and turning in the night. And I just had this epiphany. It would be better for me to go and tell my mom and dad. I thought it would just be better for me to go and confess my sins to my mom and dad so that this leverage and this stranglehold she had over me was no longer there. And I remember thinking, walking to the room, I thought, okay, I might die today because, you know, my mom and dad were all about raising godly kids and I knew I really let the bird name down. I'm trying to imagine what I would do if I found out one of my kids did this. I mean, it's horrible. 
And so anyway, I'm walking to the room and I'm thinking, right, do I wake up mom or wake up dad? And so after about 0.4 seconds of consideration, I thought, tell my dad, okay? Because <laughs> my mom is scary when she's mad, okay? Like, I, I remember wooden spoons being used when I was growing up, but never from my dad, it was always from my mom. And I remember her parenting advice to me when we had kids. She was like, it's easy just to smack them as soon as they do something wrong because they get their message and you feel much better about it. I was like, okay, great advice. And so anyways, I go into the room, and I, my mom sleeps there, my dad's sleeps, I go around and say, Dad, can I talk to you, please? And he's like, he, he didn't know what was going on. And we, we kind of went out of the bedroom, and I said, Dad, back in Italy, I stole so much stuff from the so shop on campsite. And he's like, what? He said, why would you do that? And I said, there was this lad there, and he showed me how easy it was, and I just feel awful. And um, I don't know whether it was because it was so late at night, my dad didn't have the energy to actually deal with it there and then. But he was quite lenient with me. He says, look, have you said sorry to God? And I was like, well, I will do now. <laughs> you know, because, you know, once you tell mom, I might meet him tomorrow for myself. So here we go. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay. So, you know, he says, and I just remember him praying with me. And he just, I just remember him saying, Lord, thank you that Don was forgiven before he even stole it. And I remember even then I was thinking, oh, that's a, that's a curveball. That's a curveball notion here. I was forgiven before I even took anything that wasn't mine to take. Like my, my dad so believed in my salvation <laughs> that actually even though I was guilty in the eyes of the law, before God I was clean. And I, I know as a 10, 11 year old I didn't fully compute or receive that, but I remember going back to bed just thinking tomorrow's going to be a good day because there was a weight that had been lifted off me. And I remember a couple of days later my sister says, oh, go and get me a drink. And I was like, no. And she was like, I'll tell dad. I was like, go tell dad, you sucker. I'm ready. Go and tell him, please. Go and tell him. And it's amazing, really, the power of confession when it comes to the sense of freedom that we enjoy. God invites us to come and confess to him our sins, not so that we can be reminded of our guilt, but so that he can remind us of his grace. For every believer in the room today who feels like they are limping, through this week, ridden with guilt. Maybe even this morning you've done something wrong, said something wrong, thought something wrong. Listen, you are not perfect, but let me tell you, you were forgiven and washed in the blood even before you did that. If you've called on the name of the Lord, you walk in freedom, you walk in salvation. And so Satan, like my sister, is always in your ear. She's great, really. I mean, she's an Anglican vicar, so it is what it is. You decide for yourself, right? But um, she, always in my ear, all the time, Satan in your ear, saying, listen, if, God, if you took this to God, do you think he'd really forgive you? Do you think if you confessed your sins to your brother or sister at church, they would, they would really give you the grace that it talks about in the Scripture? Like, constantly, and we, we live under the ceiling and containment and restriction that God, through the cross, has already broken off our back. And so, like, just to come and ride on the back of the prophetic words this morning, let me say that we, we come into the presence of God this morning with confidence. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. We come confidently into the throne room of God, as in, it's as though we can walk right into his presence and worship him as though we are innocent because before him we are in Christ. And it, and it feels like it's too good to be true. And normally with a cynical mindset in the West, we go, if it seems too good to be true, it usually is too good to be true. Well, introduce the gospel of grace, my friends. It's irrational. It's unreasonable. Like one song we sing, it's reckless. It, it doesn't make sense, but so good is the goodness of God. That it doesn't, it doesn't stack up with the way that we treat people on earth because God's grace is determined to kind of come our way on the basis of our faith in Christ, not on the basis of the faith in ourselves. And so there's just a verse I want to bring to you this morning. And this is the word, verse in Galatians 5, verse 1. Paul writes this verse. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And it's kind of an interesting sounding opening to what he's bringing here. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Because one speaks to an end, freedom, and one speaks to the means, which is Jesus is making us free. Freedom is both the means and the end. It, it doesn't say it is for salvation that Christ has set us free, but rather that Jesus set you free so that you could live in the freedom that he achieved for you on the cross. So when you live under a veil, when you live under a level 
that God has lifted off. You are not living in the fullness of the freedom that Christ has won for you. And uh, Paul is quite quick to assert, stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Resist the notion that you are not free. Resist the notion that you, there is still something outstanding that you need to do to make this good for you. Paul says, stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. It's an interesting passage because normally when we hear that soundbite, verse 1, what our mind goes to is sin. So what we think of is stand firm then and resist pornography or stand firm then and resist the yoke of deception or stand firm then, resist the yoke of uh, gossip or resist the yoke of insecurity, resist the yoke. But the thing that Paul is talking about here, it's so interesting, he's not talking about sin, he's talking about the law. You, you can read Galatians 5, for, uh, Galatians for yourself, Paul is really addressing a very critical issue that is coming into the church and what it is, is some messianic Jews, Jews who had become Christians, come into the church and were still promoting that you needed to do some things in order to be saved. And Paul is responding to this notion that like maybe the grace of Christ wasn't quite enough for your salvation, and that maybe you still needed to add some things to your salvation. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not be yourselves burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In other words, don't think for one minute that you still have to obey the law in order to be saved. The, the, the thing specifically that the people were getting at, this Messianic Jews, was the promotion of circumcision. We know that in the Old Testament, it was something that God instructed to consecrate the people of God, to set them apart from the Gentiles, okay? So the non-Jews, there was this physical act of circumcision where they would cut it off, remove it, and there was this set-apartness about the people of God. Well, these Messianic Jews were saying, listen, circumcision is still crucial to walking with Christ. I mean, Jesus is good, and we believe that he's the Messiah, but we still believe that there are still some things that we must come under in order to fully walk out our salvation. Paul is so um, at his end with this idea that we read in verse 2, his, his full response and rebuttal, he says, mark my words. In other words, listen up, listen clear. He says, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a massive thing that Paul is saying. Christ will be of no value to you at all. If you think that Jesus and circumcision are going to save your soul, then because you're putting your faith in the circumcision, Christ is now valueless. There is no value in Christ anymore. He goes on, he says, Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, here we go, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Let me just tell you, there are about 612 laws in the Old Testament. And Paul is saying, if you are putting confidence in any one part of the law, then you are obliged to fulfill the whole law. Paul is really driving this point home. He says, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. He says, for through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. He says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. It's a powerful passage. And for every man in the room, we should be going, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Jesus, for lifting the burden of circumcision off us. 
But most of us can't relate to that because circumcision has never been a threat to our walk with Jesus. No one is pressuring you into feeling like you need to get, well, I hope they're not. If not, you're being missold PPI, don't do it, okay? But however, what might circumcision look like in this culture? This idea that I just need to do some more good things in order for Jesus to truly love me. You know, I, I need to say more of the right things. I need to like, I need to help more people in order to be saved. Now, helping more people is no bad thing, obviously. But Paul is getting to the crux of the issue, which is like, if you are putting your confidence in your works, if you are putting your confidence in your performance, then Christ is of no value to you. You have fundamentally misunderstood the power of the cross. Because either the cross works in and of itself, or it is totally redundant. If the cross still requires you to have good works, then the cross is void of power. In fact, you could say, if you were going to deduce this to a formula, that Jesus plus something equals nothing. You've misplaced your understanding. You've got your confidence in the wrong thing. Jesus plus something equals nothing. But you could say Jesus plus nothing equals everything. In fact, what, I, what I've been pondering over, the, I was going to say over the last week, in truth, over the last 12 hours, <laughs> is Jesus plus nothing equals freedom. Let me just speak this to you. If you have put your confidence in Jesus... Jesus has done the heavy lifting. There is nothing more outstanding. There's there's nothing that you need to do to get more saved. You have received the righteousness of Christ and sometimes you may feel righteous, sometimes you may feel like you're the schmuck of the earth, but let me tell you, if you put your confidence in Jesus, then that's all you need. Now, it's important to note, because obviously, good works aren't bad. But it's where do those good works feature in your life? Is it because you feel obliged to do the work so that Jesus can love you more? Because if that's where they're placed, then you misunderstand, you misunderstand grace. In fact, Paul drives this whole point home really hard in Ephesians 2. Very well-known passage. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Everyone say grace. Grace. Grace speaking of a gift. It's a gift. It's not a payment, it's a gift. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. So grace is, grace is received through the mechanism of faith, through the mechanism of belief. So I receive grace when I believe that grace is sufficient for me. And he says, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's a gift. Friends, it's a gift. This is great news because sometimes like, um, I, I, I think sometimes I can fall into the slip of like, maybe God's more impressed with me when I'm, when I'm preaching better. You know, sometimes I go through since where I preach, I, I'm not happy with what I'm preaching and sometimes I just want to be in a dark room and I just want to be before the Lord and go, Lord, I blew it again. I had 35 <coughs> slash an hour and a half with those people this morning to convey a message and I felt like I missed the mark and I just want to be in a dark room and sometimes I want to cry because, because I just feel like, Lord, I've let you down. And there's that Maverick City line that in, ultimately I was never holding him up. Like this idea that like I can miss the mark by my own estimations. But when I do that, I actually undermine the power of grace in my life because it is grace that, is, that I've been saved through faith. In other words, if I never preach again, I'm still, I'm still good with God. Some of you need to hear that. Because like, it is a hard thing for us to receive and swallow. If you never do another good deed, I would ask the question, why aren't you doing good deeds? But if your faith is, if, you're, if you think you receiving grace is dependent on you doing good deeds, then... Listen, your, your faith is misplaced. He says, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And that's a glorious thing. No one can boast. I can't boast about my good deeds because it's a work of the grace of God that was a free gift. How can I boast about something that was given to me? And this is the bit I just want us to think about for a moment. Verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, this is important because it's not that good, good works are uncoupled from our Christian faith, but they are the byproduct of our Christian faith. Notice what comes first. I am God's handiwork. I am created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So what comes before the good works is the revelation of my worth before God. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? So often we, we go, if I do the good works, then I can declare myself God's handiwork. But no, the, 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 the posture I adopt first is, I am God's handiwork, and because I'm God's handiwork, I'm creating Christ to do great works. So the things I do in life are not to get saved. They are because I am saved. My good works flow from the grace I have received in Christ. My good works do not lead to grace from Christ. They flow from grace in Christ. This is what God is trying to tell us this morning. And I think it's kind of amazing because all the words that are coming are just affirming this. And I didn't talk to anyone. In fact, this morning I woke up and I thought, Lord, I don't even know how this really fits. But that's kind of what I feel I've got to go after. And then the words start coming and I just get the sense that the Holy Spirit this morning is just trying to get us to leave knowing that it's all on the grace of God. I mean, that classic hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. It's not just a nice poetic sounding verse. It's, it's loaded with truth. It's laden with truth. It's beautiful because I was blind, but now I see I was lost, but now I'm found. And it's all due to the goodness of God, not due to the goodness of me. God's handiwork. Now, obviously, when we talk about freedom, we typically go, what are we freed from? And that's a, that's a good line of inquiry. What is it that God has freed us from? Well, freed us from the power of sin. Amazing. He has uh, freed us from the weight of guilt. Amazing. I mean, that's true. Like, if you are walking in guilt this morning, that is not from God. God does not bring condemnation. In fact, uh, Paul says in Romans 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So there may be conviction... There may be a sense of the Holy Spirit saying we need to work on this. But don't get confused with condemnation. Condemnation just feels like you're going to get stuck and you're never going to move. Conviction is this empowering force that just reveals to you the thing that God is saying. It's time to lay this down. But like so often we think about what are we free from? But with the rest of my message this morning I want to answer the question, what are we free for? What are we free for? And so we go back to Galatians 5 and we jump down a few verses and look at what Paul says. After he says it is for freedom that Christ set us free. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But you were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. He says, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then, I don't know why the K's there. <laughs> K? <laughs> Love yourself, K. Right? If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So, let me just try and convey this in a way that makes sense. One of the challenges that even Paul deals with, I think it's in Romans 6, is this idea. If God's grace is so good, if God's freedom is so powerful, then surely we can just keep on sinning, right? Like surely we don't need to kind of get our lives in order because God's grace is so sufficient and so powerful, we can continue to indulge and flirt and flirt with sin and do all these things. And Paul, I think it's in Romans 6, says like, why would you want to do this? You have died to sin. In other words, yes, God's grace is sufficient for every sin you will commit. God's grace is sufficient, but Paul is, is appealing to a greater reality, which is like freedom is found in pursuing holiness, not pursuing sinfulness. So Paul here in Galatians 5 is making this case. He's saying, what are you free for? It's not, to, it's not for sinning. <laughs> it's not to indulge in the flesh. He says, you are made free. Why? To serve. Serving one another humbly 
in love. And I've been thinking about this because sometimes I think this is one of the areas that we misplace in our understanding of church. That like, I, like, do I serve because I want to be a better person? Do I serve because I want God to love me more? Oh, I want the church to love me more. Or do I serve because I am fully loved by my Father? You see, one flows from security and the other one flows from insecurity. One flows from a place of, I have all the affirmation and value I need in God and so I serve. And the other one says, I serve because I'm still craving that sense of affirmation and value. One of the things that I felt God told me to do, I, do, I, I tried to put it down to the fact that I was tired because when I was praying about this on the flight, I felt God say to me, uh, okay, let me just ask this question. Who, who's got quite smelly feet? <laughs> Who has got quite smelly feet? <laughs> Ali, thank you. Ali, are you all right to do something weird this morning? <laughs> Come on down, my man. I don't know how to put it to you. And I wrestled with this because I hate feet. I hate feet. Of all the things God made, feet, I don't get. I don't know why they just couldn't be like cleaned off stumps. I don't know. But dude, come and sit here, please. If, are you happy for this? <laughs> I don't know if they're smelly now, though. Well, you know what? I, I said to John this morning, John Sullivan, I says, listen, I feel like the Lord might be telling me to clean somebody's feet here this morning. And I was kind of... I was kind of mindful that it could look a bit, like, a bit, eh. Like, it's not really the kind of thing you do publicly, because I'm not trying to affirm, like, this sense of, oh, look how good I am. I was like, is it a bit cheesy? And John says, it depends who you choose. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you, Joe. Come on, have a seat, dude. Take off just one of your shoes, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> oh, feet, okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Well, my name's Dom, first of all, right? <laughs> no, you're right. Thank you, Jesus. Right, I did have my marigolds in here, but I don't know whether I'm going to I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, I did have some soap in here, but... Uh, oh, here we go. Right, now, if this is your first time to Sunny Hill, trust me, no one's more weirded about this than me, okay? This is not norm. Right, feel free to put it in there. All right? And there's a flannel, there's some soap, dude. Knock yourself out. <laughs> I'm playing. Oh, dude, your feet are all right. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Right, that's good. Right. So, like I say, this is a very weird thing. I think it's, it's you know, like I say, I, I was flying back and I, someone actually gave me a prophetic word about washing feet whilst I was in Uganda. And I don't know, I think God has been working in my head this because... I don't know, I, I just feel like this is a little bit awkward, and so I feel if I can talk for as long as possible, then the process can happen for as little as possible. No, I'm playing. Um, yeah, right, okay. So, very weird. I don't even know where to start with this, dude. Right, maybe let's put it this way. Jesus love is very wonderful. Jesus love is very wonderful. I don't even know what to do here, guys. Right? What did you say? Oh, shut your face. <laughs> more so, more so, right. <laughs> I rebuke that in Jesus' name, right. Okay, so this feels weird. I'm sure for Ali, it feels really weird. I like, I'm feeling like I'm not even doing a good demonstration. I know how to wash myself, by the way, although I don't look like it right now. And literally, I woke up at about one in the morning, and I was grappling with the Lord. I was like, Lord, is there another illustration? Please, you, you're so creative, God. Surely there's another thing up there in heaven that you can say, do this instead. But I just do want to take the other one off as well, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah go for it. Mm. As I say, if this is your first time Sunny Hill, this is not a norm. Maybe it should be a norm, I don't know. Yeah, right on the door, right on the door. <laughs> yeah, okay. How does it feel, Ali? To be honest, I 
honest, I, I don't know what to say, so... <laughs> Silence may be the best ally today, yeah? After how did I end up here? <laughs> <laughs> now you're reviewing that choice, right? Okay, so you feel kind of weird. I feel kind of weird. I think 200 plus people feel kind of weird. We all kind of feel weird together. Yeah. It is in the Bible, you're right. I will get to that. I'm not just doing this for my own pleasure here, all right? <laughs> Thank you for letting me wash your feet, dude. Oh, wow. Appreciate that. You can put your feet there, on there. Right. Now, for those of you who are aware, who have read the Bible, you can just stay there and enjoy, enjoy the dry towel for a minute, okay? In John chapter 13, just go there together. In John chapter 13, it's really interesting because we, we, we see this picture play out. I was making sure I had the right flannel then. <laughs> Just like, oh, what? <laughs> for a moment, for a moment, you never know. That's why I went for different colours this morning. I was like, right, colour, colour code these bad boys. Right. So, verse 5 in chapter 13 this is Jesus with his disciples. Now, washing feet was kind of a custom um, in the times of Jesus. Before you would eat, when you enter someone, someone's house, you would wash their feet because obviously they wear sandals around the Middle East and so their feet would have picked up all the muck from the day. And so what you would do when you cross over the threshold of someone's house, the lowest servant, typically a child, would come and wash the feet of the guest. And it, it, was, it wasn't so much ritualistic, it was about hygiene. It was about like making a person clean and appropriate so that they can walk freely around the house and so that they can enjoy food together. In fact, even in Uganda, uh, there's, a, there's a thing now, I know we all wash our hands before dinner, but it's more of a public affair. They have a sink in the corner of the room and you go and wash your hands with soap before you sit down to eat because what you're doing is you're just cleaning the part of you ready to receive a meal that someone has prepared for you. And so that's the context where Jesus in John chapter 13, verse 5, says this. After this, Jesus poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And it's kind of an interesting moment because what Jesus is asserting to his disciples is the power of service. You know, when I was... Uh, quite new into ministry, the things that would always impress me most was the leaders and the pastors and the ministers who had the biggest platform, the ones who preached the most amount of people. But I, I think, you know, as I get more mature in Christ, the thing that impresses me more about the leader is their ability to serve the people that God has called them to lead. And what I find interesting about this moment where Jesus washes his disciples' feet, are you okay there, pal? Are you happy to sit there just for a minute? Yeah, good, thank you. It's, it's this moment here. Look at this. It's really interesting. The bit before. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Verse 4. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. The context of possibly the greatest example of servitude in all of human history the Son of God washing his disciples' feet, is that it flowed from a place of total security. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. So that when Jesus occupied the lowest position in the house, it didn't take away from kind of the position he had in his Father. Actually, it was because of his security in his position, that he knew who he was, where he had come from, and where he was returning to, that he was able to get up and occupy the lowest place in the house. This idea that as we become free in Christ and we know who we are in him, it doesn't mean always that we can ascend to the highest height. Sometimes it means that we can descend to the lowest low because actually our identity is not wrapped up in what we're doing our identity is wrapped up who we are in Christ. So whether I'm preaching, towing trailers, 
washing feet. God doesn't love me anymore. God doesn't love me any less. But what I'm demonstrating in this moment, I am most like Christ when I am adopting a posture of servitude. You can sit down. Give uh, uh, Ali a hand. Thank you, buddy. Bless you, mate. I appreciate your grace. I know that was weird, dude, but thank you. Um, there is some summer camp merch you can collect from the info point after the service, all right? People who are unable to serve in this way, it's because they're not secure in who they are. They either think, I'm not good enough to do this, or more often than not, I am too good to do this. The born-again believer who knows who they are in Christ and not serving to get kingdom brownie points because they know they don't need them, it's because they already have all they need in Christ. It's a really important thing for us to kind of receive this morning that I don't serve to please the Lord. Listen, I serve because the Lord is pleased with me. It's the most powerful expression of service is when somebody who knows, who knows who they are in Jesus is able to take the knee and serve their brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you, Ali. In fact, in uh, Philippians 2, Paul says this. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. You know, so he died a criminal's death, like the Son of God, the one who was there, who spoke the creation into being, who was the Word of God. And yet he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exhorted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I mean, isn't it a beautiful thing? Serving one another in this way like Jesus? For those of us who think like, I want to I do this. I want to I be here. I want to have this influence. Let me tell you, it doesn't start here and it doesn't start there. It starts here. Fully secure in who I am in Christ. Matthew, do you want to come up to the keyboard, please? In fact, I love this idea that when, when you know who you are in Christ, this is worth writing down if you're making notes. You can rule with the heart of a servant and you can serve with the heart of a king. She likes that one. Ah! Rule with the heart of a servant. See? She's like, that's baby talk for preach. Oh, it's he, it's Levi now, is it? Preach, Don, preach, preach. Rule with the heart of a servant. Serve with the heart of a king. So with that, I'm just going to give you three things as to why we should use our freedom to serve. The first thing is, it's the fullest expression of freedom. As I say, Galatians 5 verse 13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. There we go. You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. True freedom is not about doing whatever we please, but it's about using our liberty to love and serve others. Service is the natural outworking of love, and it is the hallmark of a life transformed by the gospel. Another reason we use freedom to serve is because we want to be like Jesus. I am most like Christ when I am in this posture. Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In John 13, the foot washing episode, we read in verse 14, 15, Jesus says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So we use our freedom to serve because when we do that, we're actually being obedient to what Jesus has invited us to do. He demonstrated and modeled this heart of servitude and says, as I have shown you, you go and do likewise. And finally, it is a blessing to serve. Again, just a verse later in John 13, Jesus says this in verse 17. He says, now you know these things, you will be blessed 
if you do them. When we serve one another, when we serve one another, compelled by our love for Jesus, not trying to get a thank you, not trying to get affirmation, not trying to get more kingdom brownie points, but when we serve one another because we know who we are in Christ, there's a sense of blessing in that. I love in Acts 20, 35, it's kind of a misplaced quote from Jesus because it's a reference to something Jesus said, which doesn't appear in the Gospels. But the writer of Acts, Luke, says, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, there's something supernatural that happens that when we serve, compelled by the love of Christ. It's like in this moment, Ali, although it was weird because there's so many people here, was blessed with clean feet. That was the physical upside to the serving. But the spiritual supernatural upside to serving now is that the Lord blesses me for blessing Ali, for giving to Ali. And so when we serve others, we not only meet their needs, but we also experience the joy and fulfillment that comes from selflessly giving of ourselves. Serving others is a blessing both to the recipient and to the servant. This morning, I really want to encourage you, you know, just to consider what your serving looks like. And I don't mean about fulfilling rotors at church. It may look like that. But I just mean in life. How are you serving your spouse? How are you serving your parents? How are you serving your children? How are you serving your friends? How are you serving your family? How are you, selling, how are you serving your colleagues? How are you serving your boss? Like there's this sense that when we, when we fully receive the grace of God, and we fully receive the revelation that we are His handiwork, then we are able to demonstrate our freedom by serving those that the Lord has put around us. And so this morning, I want to say you are free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. You are so free, in fact, that you can serve others like Jesus. You no longer have to do it to try and get good in God's eyes. You can do it because you are good in God's eyes in Christ. He has given you His righteousness by faith. He has taken your sin and He has given His righteousness. You are now not your own. You have been bought with a price. And so we wrap the towel around our waist and we serve the people of this world because we have received grace ourselves.